motivation, uh, what happens, uh, why we do certain things. Then we are going to look at a framework for uh, influencing behavior, right? And how can we do that? And of course, at the end of it, I'll take questions. Also, a little bit about me. As I said, I'm founder of Siam Computing. At Siam Computing, they've had the privilege of working with Bewell. A uh, little bit, we work with Kaveri Hospital. We work with uh, Beto, which is a diabetes care um, uh, app, which helps you monitor and take care of your diabetes management. Uh, been privileged, we work with several early stage growth stage startups. Uh, primarily focused on what your digital and product journey looks like. Um, uh, first, if you see my laptop, if you come to my office, always the first thing that's written is user first always, in this case patient first always. What are we doing uh, to make sure that the patient always wins? Uh, what are we doing to make sure that the user who is using our app is winning? And if that happens, then all stakeholders are right. And if the patient is happy, employees are going to be happy, employees are happy, stakeholders, investors, everybody's going to be happy, right? Four philosophy of that. Um, Started fairly young, I started when I was 23, I've been doing Siam Kameh for 11 years now. Uh, in that journey, we've been privileged to have worked with three tech startups that we launched and scaled. Uh, it's been a phenomenal journey. A lot of people get confused with how to pronounce my name, so I always make a point to have that little point. Thuze, from the epiglot is Vikhan. Uh, Thuze, yeah. And just a little detail about me, I love scuba diving. If anybody here, is a fan come talk to me. So first, you know some people talked about it, right? Myth number one that we are going to sort of demystify today. Gamification is not about games. As much as the world makes us believe that it's going to be about games. If people came to this presentation hoping to learn about games and what games we can play with uh, patients, uh, I'm sorry if it's going to be disappointing you. So gamification is not going to be about games. What we are going to be doing is understand the art and science of motivation, why we do what we do every day, uh, why I wake up and go to the gym or why I don't go to the gym, uh, why my parents tell me to do certain things, what are their fears and hopes and all those things, right? So that's what we're going to touch upon today. So if you look at it, right, motivation is broken down into three aspects, right? First is autonomy, second is mastery and third is purpose. Uh, autonomy is basically to be able to have your survival and basic needs met. Right? So do I have a roof? Do I have a, enough food? Am I feeling okay? Right? That's, you can't talk philosophy to somebody on an empty stomach. Right? So you have to make sure that your physiological needs are met. Second aspect of uh, driving motivation is, is there a reward or punishment? Right? Uh, if you achieve this, my mom will always say, all of my summer vacations were if you achieve 60% at least of chemistry, we are going to have a great vacation. If you want that cycle, you have to do this. If you don't do this, you will not get biryani this Sunday, right? So rewards and punishments are part of motivation. And third is intrinsic, right? Why do you, how many of you guys post something on Facebook or LinkedIn and go and check it yourself without even have no, no external triggers from Facebook or uh, LinkedIn? You posted something and about half an hour back after that, you go and check how many likes have I got. How many of you? Right? That is intrinsic motivation. Why are you doing that? Because there is an aspect of social, right? Like we are social creatures and we are need to understand am I like what I created? Was it accepted by people? That is intrinsic motivation. So I'm sure everybody has heard of Maslow's pyramid, but I just want Maslow's hierarchy, but I just want to touch upon it very quickly. As I said, first is physiological, then which is food, shelter, warmth, then we have safety, security, and health, then we need to feel connected, there's love and belonging, then there's esteem, am I respected in my community, do people like me, uh, do people appreciate what I'm saying, and then finally, right, there's this whole focus of what am I doing in my life, what is the purpose of my life, so you climb these ladders, right, you climb these steps, and as you achieve one more thing, you will finally be like, okay, what is my self-actualization goal, right? And this is what drives motivation as we go forward. Today, extrinsic motivation, as I have already given examples from my life, is the carrot and the stick. You, if you do something, you get a reward. If you don't do something well, you get a little whack or you get a little reprimand. 
But today what we are going to talk about over the next hopefully 20-25 minutes is intrinsic motivation, right? Uh, I've talked about it, we gave the example of Facebook and LinkedIn, but that is a framework and we're going to see how that applies to our life. So this is a quote that I love and it's something that we apply a lot at CRM Computing and I hope that Harsha is here and will sort of vouch for it. And you can motivate by fear and you can motivate by reward but all of those at some point will run out, right? There was this amazing uh, study that they did about these chimpanzees. So what they did is there were a bunch of six chimpanzees and every time there is a bell that is rung, uh, they would give a cookie. Right? The same one cookie every time the bell is rung. And they saw that after a point, uh, they, they split it into two. They saw that the first group, every time the bell was rung, about 30, uh, out of the 30 times they did this, only about 15 times, after the first 15 times, the chimpanzee got bored of it, right? It was the same expected thing, the bell rang as a cookie and got bored of it. The second group that was there, there was an element of surprise. When they rang that bell, sometimes there was three cookies, sometimes there was one cookie, sometimes there were no cookies, right? This element of surprise, we saw that out of the 30 times they did that experiment, almost 27%, the 27 times out of the 30, there was action that the chimpanzee always reached out for the cookie, right? So there is something here at play. It's not just as simple as rewards and punishment. There is something that is driving us, which is what we are going to look at. That is going to be a big deal. So let's begin. Dive into intrinsic motivators. Over here, I'm going to talk about this framework called the Apocalypse Framework. I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's written by this guy called Yuki Chow. Uh, he has done a great job of breaking down this in, this whole concept of intrinsic motivators into eight concepts, eight core drivers that motivates us on a daily basis. We will look at it, each of it, one by one. But the first one is meaning, second is empowerment, then there is accomplishment, then there is this concept of ownership, then there is social influence, then there is scarcity, unpredictability and avoidance, loss and avoidance. The top half are white hat intrinsic motivators, right? Things that you will do well. The bottom half are your black hat, which are uh, things that you have made, you, they play on your concept of fear, more than the concept of hope and dreams, right? All right, so the first one, this is the epitome of everything, right? We saw the master's pyramid, everybody wants to have purpose in life. So the first core drive is epic meaning and call. This is where you, you feel like you've been called to do something. How many of you guys have played any video games as a kid? Right? Uh, any names? Super Mario, you played Super Mario. What was your what was your epic call in that? Go save the princess. You need to save the princess. That's your epic call. Almost all great games that you've played, almost every single superhero movie that you've seen, right? Iron Man, you're the only one who can save us, and our entire humanity depends on this, right? That is the concept of epic meaning and call. Where and I'm sure a lot of Indian fans also use this saying, you only have to save our family's name. There is so much of responsibility. Who said that there is no gamification in your life? Raise your hands now. Every aspect of your life is gamified. Right? So when your parents are saying that you are the only one who has to save our family name, that is you being called the epic meaning and call. Right? So this is where people are motivated because they believe they are engaged in something that is bigger than themselves. This is the top of the pyramid in terms of what will drive action, what will drive motivation. I found a great example, this is something that we have seen as an organization as well. I want to play a video for you guys. So, uh, the context to this is that in one of the hospitals in the US, uh, they wanted to figure out how can they improve the experience of going for uh, your chemo treatments, right? And they had to get feedback from the kids in terms of how the experience was. So it's very difficult to get feedback, right? Especially after you've gone through such a harrowing experience, and at the end of it, if you ask for a form and be like, hey, how was it? And you take another 15 minutes. Such a terrible experience, right? So this hospital took up this and created this whole app that I want to show you. It's a three minute video. 
This is the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Within these walls every single year, thousands of children are battling cancer and are having to undergo terribly painful treatments. Children like Olivia, who eight months ago was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma. The hospital is continually trying to minimize this pain, but to do it, they must first understand it better, and most importantly, discover the medications that are working best. To do this, they need these young patients to record exactly how they're feeling in a pain journal. The challenge is that after multiple chemotherapy and radiation treatments, many kids are too tired or discouraged to even hold a pen, much less keep a detailed journal. And the sad reality is that if this data is not collected daily, it's useless. We needed to find a creative solution to collect data every single day. And with the Pain Squad mobile app, that's just what we did. To begin, our patients were enlisted as recruits in Pain Squad, a special police force dedicated to hunting down pain. We gave each recruit an Apple iPhone loaded with the Pain Squad mobile app. Then twice a day, an alert from headquarters told patients it was time to complete their pain reporting mission. Because the reports worked with iPhone's user-friendly touchscreen, kids could easily fill them out. With a simple flick of the finger, they could identify exactly where and how much it hurt, as well as which medications were working best. But making it easy was, well, the easy part. We knew to be truly successful, we needed to find a way to encourage our young target daily. So we called in some police reinforcements. Hey, rookie. Welcome to Pain Squad. It's really great you're here. We need all the help we can get to help put pain in its place. We brought together the cast of Canada's top police dramas, Flashpoint and Rookie Blue, and filmed a series of inspiring videos, then deployed them throughout the app. To encourage the kids to fill in their reports, we built in a graduation structure. When a recruit completed three reports in a row, they received a message from HQ informing them that they were moving up the ranks. You are now officially a full-fledged detective in Pain Squad. Well done. At this rate, you might even be the next chief. They just don't make them like you anymore. You truly are one of Pain Squad's best and brightest. Keep it up. Back inside the precinct, recruits could check to see when to fill out their reports and how many badges they had earned. And once their last report was filed, they were sent one final message informing them that they were being retired from the field. But this case isn't closed yet. Your squad is still fighting. We couldn't have done it without you. So way to go. The Pain Squad app is now set to roll out into four other Canadian hospitals. And due to its success, it will soon be made available everywhere. The app is an excellent tool. That's her control uh, over the pain because she's able to document it herself, but she's using an app. She just glides right through it and it makes her feel that she's a part of this. It's fantastic that you all were able to come up with this. It really helps. Just got the word from Chief. Turns out you've been doing so great, he feels like you're ready to move up. You're well on your way to putting pain in its place. Don't stop now, you're almost there. Congratulations. Oh, cool. Sergeant. <laughs>
There's another example, great story that we came across. So there was this hospital in, in Portugal that was struggling with making sure that nurses sanitize their hands before they uh, approach every, every bed. Right? So what they did was, before every station, they had the uh, RFID tags of nurses and then there was a sanitation and they had a small uh, camera there, right? So as you approach them, you sanitize your hand and it would pick up to the nurses and clock you, saying Dr. Kartika sanitized their hand, uh, Harsha sanitized their hand, Sunday sanitized their hand and they kept doing that and towards the end, you can see the picture, there's a leaderboard up at the top there and it shows that who is the leading person who's doing this really well and who's not, right? It's a simple thing but again, somebody talked about competition and motivation and all this thing. This is where you feel like, hey, as a team we clocked this, we, we did this. The example that you talked about that, uh, we walked 12 million steps together, right? That's all uh, part of accomplishment and you feel great because we did this together, right? So that's core drive number two. Core drive three, right? So people like feeling like they're in control, right? Especially in hospitals and in, in cases where you have sicknesses, you want to feel like you're not lost. I had my granddad extremely, uh, you know, self-respect, very important for him. He had to go through a knee uh, operation, but he was so um, particular that he would do certain tasks on his own, right? And that feeling of empowerment, feeling of independence is quite high for us, right? Uh, we don't want to feel helpless, right? So, this is one of the examples we did for one of our clients called Vito. You can see in the video, we created something called a daily lifestyle sport, right? In less than two minutes, you can take a quick assessment of what your lifestyle today was. Very simple, very basic questions of when did you eat? Did you drink today? Did you work out? Did you do this, right? And at the end of it, you get a basic, simple lifestyle sport. Today you are good, 80% 80, 80 good and you have a streak and how your speed is speed that is your top line. The multiple gamification elements over there, which we'll talk about in a bit. But over there, just the fact that I have a tool that can tell me how I'm doing, right? I don't need uh, external help. I am empowered, I have the tool to understand how and where I'm on my health path. Alright. Code cool drive number four, uh, ownership, right? Have you guys had something that you really, really like and then uh, when somebody asks for it, you have to think about it a little bit before you give it? Let me, let me show an example. How many of you guys have assembled ownership and possession is based on the principle that if you want something, you want to improve it, uh, you want to protect it, get more of it. But I was going to ask a question. How many of you guys have assembled uh, an IKEA furniture. No one? So I saw one hand, right? Do you, if you have assembled your own IKEA furniture, that furniture is always going to be super special to you, right? It's the same thing. Uh, you could have bought it from the store or you could have uh, ordered it on Amazon. But since you made it, it's yours now, right? Whenever I cook, my biryani is the best because I made it. And I hardly ever cook, but since I cook that day, that sense of ownership is there, right? And I'm like this, I killed it today. That's the co-drive of ownership, that if I make something of my own, right? Uh, it is special to me. And you see this in a lot of apps. How many of you guys have gone and when Facebook came up in the early days, right? You would go and put your banner, uh, cover picture, customize the theme, make, choose the colors that you like, all of those things, right? All of that is ownership because they want you to change these things, make it your own so that it belongs to you, it feels like it's your own. And once that happens, then that code life kicks in, that it's mine, I will love it, protect it, use it as much as I can. Also, uh, since we're talking about patient experience, the one great example of code life of ownership is our one precious life, right? I feel like that can be used in many ways to drive on the point of ownership. So this is your life, this is your own, and how are you going to make it better? Also a good example of ownership is credit card points, or points in general, right? Uh, I have an access credit card, uh, and 
and recently they devalued it, right? So it was worth certain amounts and then suddenly they said that it's going to be worth less. And I thought I was upset and then when I went on Twitter, there was a full Twitter war against access. I have never used my access points, okay? But it was mine, how could you take it away, right? It's a sense of ownership, that is mine and I spent so much and I earned those points. I have never seen anything but I was enraged the fact that they decided to reduce it. So these are ways of examples of how these core drives are influencing us. Core drive number five, social influence. Uh, very simple, very easy to relate to. Um, all of us are social animals, right? Uh, all of us dress up a particular way because we want to be seen in a particular way. We want to be liked. Uh, when we go to an office, we have our set of friends. When we come and do this presentation, before I got on the stage, I am you know, having fingers crossed and feeling like, is this going to be okay? Uh, I hope that it's well received. But these are uh, uh, internal core drive of uh, us wanting to feel like we belong, right? Uh, as humans, we evolved as hunter-gatherer communities and we always lived in tribes. And it was very important to build this connection and association with each other. Um, so, social influence related to actively respect and what other people think or do or say. Um, in my family, I always, right, do lo kya kaenge, like what if you, al kaena so long right? Uh, it's, that, it's that aspect of social likeness that's very, very innately driven inside us. Um, we have used social in a lot of ways. Uh, Dr. Kartika is talking about community. Community is that. Right? So you have photos. This is an example of uh, people celebrating not having seizures. Right? So they go out and uh, go get their surgeries or go get their medicines. And then they come and talk together as a group. There is no uh, influence of the doctor, nurse, hospital, etc. But it's just important that they are able to connect with each other and talk about it. You guys have heard of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? All of these are examples of social influence, right? Where you have a support group and you're able to talk about it and celebrate wins, motivate each other when there is a fault. Um, can any of you think of digital examples of social influence? There we go. Any of your social media, right? The, I gave away the answer at the beginning. That when you put something up, Right. Almost never has Facebook sent me an external uh, notification saying go look at what's happening on your post. Right? I will always go to it on there. I have posted it. Sometimes I'll be upset saying I put so much effort creating this, nobody liked it. Sometimes I'm very happy that you know I put this video or whatever and so many people are liking it. So that social influence I think. Um, going to show off my perfect metabolic score that I uh, achieved luckily. But this is ultra human. Have you guys heard of ultra human? Ultra human is a continuous glucose monitoring uh, app uh, which allows you to see what your sugar levels are and you're able to see uh, how people are uh, trending. So I ate at Garden Company and then immediately I saw how my sugar spike, right? It's just geeky things that you look at, but what is important over here is this, right? It's telling me that I'm at the top 4.2% of all people uh, who, are, who are using ultra human. And I said, this was an anomaly, I've never had this tool. But I took a screenshot, I said to my girlfriend, like, look, I'm at top 4.2%. <laughs> but that social aspect of it, right, is so important for me that I want to feel like, hey, I'm killing it, I'm doing so well. And this is what drives um, behavior, this is what motivates me. As I said, I was sitting there, ate a kasa kandi, immediately checked my sugar. And I was like, okay, this is not good, so I should be off sugar. But I'm just doing this for a week because for me to get right to implement this, I'm a guinea pig of sorts. But it's, it's changing my behavior. I'm looking at sugar. If you, if another day, I love my cake, right? I will eat cake, any, any meal. Uh, you give me a good piece of chocolate cake, I'll have it. But right now, because I want to be in my top 5%, 10%, this changing my behavior. Code right number six. Scarcity. Before I show an example, can you guys think of examples of where you have uh, done certain things because of uh, scarcity? 
provisions that were folded during COVID. COVID remedies were uh, everywhere, everybody went and bought it, but there was this concept of there's going to be scarcity and therefore we have to take action. Um, if you had a sibling, if you had a sibling, the scarcity thing is always there, right? Uh, there are only X number of chocolates, X number of whatever. And who's going to finish what? Even if you're not hungry, even if you don't want it. But there's only so much resources that are there that we have to take care of. Uh, yes, so this is the definition, this is the drive that motivates us because some resources are immediately difficult to get or very few in quantity. Uh, one of the greatest tricks used in e commerce, right? Seven days left for this price. Afterwards, it's going to go up. Okay? Uh, if any of you are salespeople, you always know that this is a trick. Right? But this is scarcity, code right, being tricked and used at you. Where you feel, so now we are on to the last three of the code right, which are negative code right? rights. The first five are positive and working on your hopes. Now it's working on your fears. So scarcity is where you feel like some things are only limited. And it has to be done now. Or if I don't do this now, I'm going to miss an opportunity of a lifetime. Right? So, uh, seven days left to buy this cycle for $99. A uh, lot of times people use time as an element, especially in healthcare as well. Right? If you don't take care of your health, uh, if you don't go to physiotherapy, you're going to lose at least five years of good mobility. Right? So, a lot of use of negative. Uh, fear tactics to sort of help you do or drive behavior and decision. Four drive number seven, curiosity. Uh, <coughs> examples of curiosity. Let me show you the definition and then I'll tell you examples. This is when we have infatuation with certain things that are unpredictable. Right? I gave the example of chimpanzee. That was the example of code drive seven, which is curiosity. You just you will do things because it's interesting and it's fun. But what are some examples? That the answer is on the slide. Gambling. Sorry? Gambling. Exactly, right? All the casinos of the world, okay? Try on this code drive, which is there is going to be some amount of uh, adventure. That there is a large pot of gold at the end of it, you don't know what you're going to get. And they will use that negative code line number seven to get you to do certain things. Right? Uh, but also can be used in a positive way. And I'm going to show you an example of how it's used in a positive way. But I can guarantee you, everybody who's used Google Pay here, everybody's used Google Pay, you were gamified when the scratch card came out. For one or two rupee, you kept going and scratching it, right? You were a gamified. So everybody who said that there's no gamification in my life, at the end of this, I'm sure you will know how it's being used. So this is an example of how GE uh, designed the experience, and I think you also talked about it with the whole on birthdays and all that stuff, right? So it's a great case study. It's a long case study. I'm going to just a minute of it. <coughs> but GE was tasked with a problem, saying that. Kids don't adhere to CT scan well. Right? They're super scared. And we have to either sedate them, and only then we can uh, get the CT scan done, or we have to keep having multiple attempts at it. And therefore, not very good for hospitals. Also, not a great uh, experience for the patient, for the parents. Everybody is scared. And they tasked this guy to think about how to change this experience. And what he did was, First thing that he did was he uh, it's, a, it's a long case, but the first thing he did was he spent an entire day on his knees. Like I need to see what a five-year-old kid looks at. Like I'm, I'm 34 years old and I can see this CT scan, but what does the CT scan look like for a five-year-old? And from there the whole uh, aspect of what they did came about. I'm going to show you a quick video. Hi, I'm Doug Dietz. I'm the principal designer for Global Design at GE Healthcare, and I'm the lead designer for Adventure Series. The Adventure Series is really an activity that we've been working on to see what can we do around our diagnostic imaging equipment to make it friendlier for 
uh, both the family and for young patients. We have large diagnostic imaging equipment at G Healthcare. They're huge and some of them make noises. Adventure Series is really looking at it really from the child's perspective, looking at where their anxiety points are and uh, coming up with some really nice solutions that help those, whether those are visually uh, taking over the room in a theme, like a jungle theme or a, a pirate adventure or something, as well as music that leads them into the room and coloring books. But we wanted to have elements that addressed all the anxiety points. My name's Liz Auer. I'm Duncan Auer. Where is this? Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Well, we're here today for a CT scan of Duncan's sinuses. He's had some really chronic congestion and coughing. So uh, we're going to have a, have a look and see what's going on in there. And the pirate, pirate room was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The room was painted completely like a pirate setup, um, including the floor. The floor was like, a, um, like a, the dock with, with the water on the sides and uh, animals and things on the walls. And the CT scanner itself was like the wheel of a pirate ship. It's, um, for a child, it can be kind of scary. You, know, you see things that make noise and, and they look very institutional. And, and uh, this is, you're not even really thinking about the fact that you're doing a procedure. Very, very welcoming, very um, whimsical and fun. Distractions. We don't taste anything. Our immune drop by 85%. Right, without sedation, and they made this into from the moment the child stepped in to the moment it left. It was about you as the captain of this pirate ship, and there are going to be scary noises, there are going to be things, but you have to be brave because you are the captain and you have to see us through, right? And they made this experience so multiple elements of unification again. You are the captain, escort line number one, right? Epic meaning and call. You are, you are here to save us. But also curiosity, this is an experience created for me, what is going to happen next, all of those used to cooking it right. As I already said, everybody who's used Google Pay, you have been uh, a victim of four drive number seven, which is curiosity. And finally, we have four drive number eight, which is loss and avoidance. Right? So at the very top, you have epic meaning and call. And at the very bottom, you have loss and avoidance. Both are equally powerful, but one really works on your open hopes and dreams. The other one at the bottom really works on your fear. Right? Uh, here's the definition uh, it motivates the fear of losing something or having undeserved events transpire. Uh, any examples that you have seen of loss and avoidance? Uh, I'll show you another example. Uh, 
Uh, any, anybody use Snapchat here? Not the audience, right? But streaks, right? So if you've done, if you've been doing something and then you keep uh, getting a streak, say one day streak, two day streak, three day streak, five day streak, and it's it's a crazy thing. So on Snapchat you have this take off. Um, if you text somebody every day, just one picture you send them, you start a streak. So if you drive for two days continuously. You get a two day streak, then there's a three day streak. And on just on your friend's picture, let's say four and uh, icon of a five, right? And this is crazy because friendships were decided on streaks. Saying you he had a hundred day streak going and you broke it. I don't know if you are friends anymore, right? Uh, this is the this is the motivation of lost avoidance, right? That on vacation my friend he didn't have signal. He made sure he came back and he sent that picture because he couldn't, like he would get the worst of it if he broke the streak. Right? So this is loss and avoidance. Uh, but one very very popular example is cigarette packets, right? One precious life, if you do this, these are the consequences of what will happen to you. Right? Uh, of every day, every time being reminded of uh, loss and avoidance. A dear colleague of mine, when I sent him this presentation, he was like, oh, I don't know this. Where you just poke and it's like, okay, this just makes me feel bad. But it's true, right? This is this is what is driving you for, for people who are stopped smoking or whatever, right? Like, you know, this is lost avoidance. That uh, advertisement that you see in the cinemas, driving home the point. Alright, so I'm done, two minutes and 30 seconds left. But I wanted to also make sure that there are tactical takeaways for you all, right? Uh, I hope that through this presentation, you are able to understand that internal motivations are greater than external triggers, right? You need to think about why you are doing anything. It could be your patient, it could be your employee. The same framework can be used for anything. It can be used for your child, for your girlfriend. Don't tell them I told this. But it can be used for anything, right? Uh, gamification is not just tech based, definitely not just game based. It's this art and science of motivation. There are eight core drives that drive human behavior. I hope for people who are running hospitals, etc., that you go and speak to at least five to ten patients and ask them two questions: like, what are your hopes and fears, dreams and fears? And we, we do this a lot. So then we start doing our product strategy. This is all we do. We go and take user interviews and we ask them, what are your hopes and dreams, and what are you most afraid of? And then from there we try to come up with uh, concepts using these eight code rights of how we can influence certain behaviors. Um, map out one outcome you want to influence to one code, right? Don't do too many. Just do one and see what happens. Then, of course, if you at any point want to sit down and brainstorm, say, because I'm doing this, is this going to work? Always happy to have a look and chat with you all. Alright, so with that long presentation, we're done. Thank you so much. I hope this was useful. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them at this point. Can you give me an example? What exactly we can do? Like, assuming a, a person has shared one of your hopes, yeah. can you give me a scenario that we can kind of uh, do? Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story of what we did with Vito. So, with Vito, Vito is a diabetes management company, and uh, they are trying to figure out how to see people in optimal uh, sugar levels. So, we went and spoke to this person, right? And the whole thing was. So this is a mother daughter you know, the father had passed away on something and the mother was like I always take my medicines on time okay uh, and I was like that's great how are you doing this she's like my daughter will make sure that I take my medicines on time okay I was like okay so I did when I said to you at the end of it I was like can I speak to your daughter and I was like uh, Akansha what is the thing that you know what are your hopes and dreams and fears and she's like okay I'm going to get a new job, okay? And now I'm going to move away. Who is going to remind my mom? Okay, I'm really afraid of this. So from there we got a feature of the daughter being able to have a view on adherence of their mom. So Vito has always been for the patient on this, right? No lens of caregiver. In this case, the caregiver is important because certain behavior is driven by the children. So 
uh, we built the whole feature of a caregiver model where it was very important that the caregiver was in the loop uh, of what the patient is doing. Uh, and I thought that made a lot of sense. So as we did more interviews, we, we saw that pattern again and again. Um, you know, kids in the US worried about parents. Uh, kids in the city worried about parents back home. And the, the notion of guilt in the ability of kids that did not really come from the parents. So on that we built a whole caregiver model and saw that the journey that the caregiver can have and be in control of most of it, the parents. Is there a statement? Yeah. Alright, so we have no more time left. Um, yeah. uh, thank you very much again. Uh, these are my coordinates. If you want to talk, chat, always feel free to reach out to me. Sure. Thank you so much for such an interesting session. Thank you for being with us this morning.